Good morning. Thank you for joining us online. We're excited to share what God is doing in our midst and want to keep you up to date with the following announcements. Lockdown is a time of prayer. Unity lies within the power to hear the same thing from God. Join us on Monday nights for intercession from 8 to 9 p.m. No more intercession at 6 o'clock in the mornings. Explore with us the book of Daniel every Tuesday morning from 6.30 till 7 a.m. We discuss one chapter at a time with a week of exploring in between. Let's search the historical context and relevance of Daniel's prophecies together. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be after me. I, I am the Lord. ministry is funded by the generous giving of our members and friends. Kindly support this ministry by giving towards our cause. We are all affected by the current circumstances, but sadly some are more affected than others in this difficult time. Please help us to help those in need by giving towards our BodyServe account. Hi everybody, it's a privilege to bring you the offering message this morning and I'm going to read out of the second part of Psalm 24. Jen actually read the first part last week and I want to encourage you to really go spend time with Psalm 24. Um, it says here from verse 7, Lift up your heads, O you, o you gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. And I just, I'm so encouraged with all the testimonies coming through at the moment with God showing Himself strong and mighty. And it happens when we allow Him to come into our lives and put Him first. And, you know, there's been some tight spots with finances the last while that some of you know uh, with the church. But it's amazing how God has really come through for us with the Opperman's visas, uh, YMCA rental agreement. Uh, our annual accounts was able to be able to submit that through uh, a long negotiation um, with the with the auditors and it's, it's just really God is so with us at this time and I really want to encourage you guys to press in lift your heads O you gates let the king of glory come in um, in this time so I'm just going to close in prayer uh, be encouraged father we thank you that you are the lord of our lives thank you that you are showing yourself strong and mighty in our midst and uh, we just give you all the glory and honor today with our finances even lord we show you know, we just want to show you lord that we love you through that lord in jesus name Good morning. Amazing to spend some time with you uh, on this Sunday morning uh, during still a partly uh, lockdown situation. And uh, we are privileged to, uh, to get together at least um, informally at this time as a church. But uh, still we want to uh, send out this message this morning uh, to keep your hearts intact with what God is saying to, to, to us as a body. Um, it's really a privilege to have you if you are even logging in from wherever um, over the world. 
uh, it's always good to, to spend some time with you and trust God to, to grow with us as we are seeking His face. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence and the fact that you are a God that is committed to us. Father God, and you are expecting the same kind of commitment. Father, we know that we are not as faithful as you are because you are an everlasting God with everlasting commitments. Um, and Father, this morning, we bring our souls to you. We, we ask you, Father, for forgiveness where we miss these commitments with you. Father, we, we fall short on the promises that we even make toward you. And Father, we, we just know your love. We know that you are a loving God that reaches out to us and embrace us, Father, as your children. And this morning, we want to sit on your lap. We want to experience, Father God, your, your life-giving uh, words over our lives. And we want to trust that, Father God, you will just take us from strength to strength in our relationship with you. Uh, just give us the reminder again this morning, Father, that you are a loving Father that is committed to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I want to share a few things with you this morning that I believe God is uh, putting on my heart and, and uh, is installing in all of our hearts. Um, and that is the one of covenant covering. The fact that God is a covenant God. And, you know, when it comes to covenant theology, many times, you know, people are afraid to even talk about it because we fall so short um, in our commitments to to God and even to what one, one another because um, we can clearly as humans not be committed as God is committed. And, um, and we see such covenants being made in biblical times. You know, Abram did um, make such um, a covenant even with God. Um, they've made it with one another. And I just want to just mention how covenant happened in um, Old Testament terms. And uh, then we can this morning just read a few scriptures. And, and I know that there's a few, so please hold on. Um, we're going to read through all of them and trust God to, to just lighten our hearts uh, with the promises that he has uh, given us in the past. So what normally happened when a covenant was made between two people, these days, you know, it's so easy to break a contract uh, because um, you, um, yeah, you can just make it right, you know, with the compensation of financial gain toward the other person. But in biblical times, covenants were really um, the only kind of true um, commitment or relationship understanding that um, people had in the Old Testament. And it meant that if you did not keep to the covenant that was made between two persons, you would die as a result of it. Now, um, we see what normally happened was two people came together and they, um, they had basic agreement on you know, what would happen in this covenant, what was expected of both parties, and also what would happen if those parties don't adhere to, um, to these um, commitments. Now, they would then exchange their mantles. Now, for David and uh, Jonathan, we know that David gave his shepherd boy um, cloak or mantle to to, to Jonathan, and Jonathan gave him the kingly robe, or the prince's robe at least. Um, and, and that meant that wherever David then would go around, he, the people would know that because David has the covering of Jonathan, um, the two of them were connected to one another, um, and that Jonathan would come to the aid of David if anything would go wrong. Um, unfortunately, while David was running around in the wilderness, uh, we know Jonathan was sitting in the palace and um, it didn't really work out for David that well. Um, but nevertheless, covenant was made between people. The robes were exchanged and robes were also the status of the time. We know about this in Joseph's life. Joseph received a mantle or a robe that um, that was beautiful and that gave him status in society and showed the favor that his dad bestowed upon him. And so mantles also was the status of a person. Um, as we would these days joke and say that shoes are a representative of, um, you know, how much money you have. 
uh, or status. Uh, those days, it was definitely mantles. Um, it showed a lot about you as a person. And when you exchange it with a covenant partner, basically you gave your identity or your status toward um, the other person and people will, would identify that and know that you've got the backing of that person. The other thing that happened was you ex exchanged belts. Now we know that weaponry was put around the, the belts, even your water and your uh, accessories, anything that you uh, needed um, when you travel or, or go about um, was around your belt. So when you exchange belts, you basically say to one another, whatever you have um, that is a gift or a... Uh, um, a tool or a, you know, a accessory, it uh, also come to your aid if you need it. If you ever need such help, uh, I would be there for you. I will cover you. Um, they would then exchange blood, uh, making a mark on both wrists of the two uh, covenant partners, and they will mingle the blood. And the blood would mean that uh, until death do us part. So we mingle blood because uh, your life source and your, you, you as a life, uh, uh, as a person that lives, <laughs> um, you know, make a covenant with me um, so that the two of us will, will be blood brothers. And, um, and then they would do the declaration of the agreements of both parties toward one another. They would speak it out aloud and then they would walk underneath the staff of um, the person. Now, even the families of these covenant partners would then walk underneath the staff to declare that me and my family and those who support me um, are committed toward this um, covenant that we are making today. Now, you know, God honors covenant. And, and, and the, the only understanding that God has for relationship or true relationship is the kind of commitment where he gives everything, where covenant is important for him um, because he is as committed. You know, when he gives his word, his promise, then he does not turn against it and he will not walk away from it. He um, is God and therefore all the resources that is necessary is to his um, benefit and he can use that toward his covenant partners. So it's a benefit to be a, a covenant partner with God the Almighty. <laughs> and, and that was um, the blessing of covenant partners in the biblical times, is that people always knew that if I have a covenant partner that is stronger than myself, then I know that it's beneficial to me because he will come to my aid and I will have a lot of resources to my exposure. Now, with if you have a covenant with God the Almighty, this means that you have the greatest um, backing of anyone and any, anything in the world and beyond the world in the universe. Um, and this is the kind of covenant that Abraham went into with God. Um, and he was committed to, to it as a person. But God even had to make him to go to sleep while he made the covenant with him because God knew that even the vows or the the commitments that he made from his side would not be um, trustworthy because as people, we are not worthy and we are always breaking promises. But nevertheless, the heart of covenant is important and the commitment that comes with it, even though we know that we are making mistakes sometimes in it, being humble in in recognizing our mistakes and, 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 and reassuring our commitment toward um, um, God and toward them covenant partners in those days, you know, is of crucial importance. So Hebrews 7 verse 22 says that uh, Jesus, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So Jesus did not come to replace the old covenant um, with Abram. But Jesus came to fulfill all the promises that was made, all the covenants of the Old Testament that was made. And we know that there was a few, and I will mention it later on as well. But all of those covenants, Jesus came to reaffirm them and say, said that God is still committed to those covenants. But the better covenant is the one of a heart connection. And that's why being part of the old covenant would have been 
to, uh, to go through circumcision if you were male. And that meant that you, as a sign, would also be included in all the promises um, with the covenant um, in God. Um, but, but now we find in the new covenant, Jesus is the guarantor, which means that he is the one that, that um, would put his money on the table. He would put his money where his mouth is and he will be the one who made the, f- the full commitment and the full price of commitment toward us. Um, and he knew that we fell short and that we never get it right. And therefore he came as a redemption so that we can be connected to God. Now God, having a covenant understanding with us, is so committed that, um, that he's always willing to come back to the, to, to the table. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent, more excellent, then the old, as the covenant he mediates, is better, since it enacted on better promises. Um, and we must remember this, that uh, all the promises of the past is building up, and the, those promises uh, we are included in. But Christ is bringing even a better covenant, the one where he is our mediator. Ephesians uh, 2 verse 11 to 13 says, Therefore remember that at one time you... Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers. Listen to the strangers to the covenants of promise. We, we were not part. Those of us that are not Jews were not part of the covenant having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So because those of us that are not Jews um, and were not circumcised and not part of um, the promises of of Abram, um, came into a relationship with God, Christ and a good standing with Christ and um, are walking the road in relationship with him, we are now included in the covenant. And um, this is because we believe in Jesus. We believe as covenant partakers um, in the, 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 the promises that he um, brought into our lives. And, and so in Exodus uh, I want us to go and actually read about the old covenants. What were those covenants that was promised to the people of, of Israel that we are now part of because we um, have Christ in our lives? Uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and people of Israel groaned because of the slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abram, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Exodus 6 verse 5. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves and I've remembered my covenant. And so, so even though Israel was not faithful Um, to God as they were supposed to, as his people to put him first. And and I just want to say, you know, God's greatest desire with covenant is that as he's expecting between a bride and a bridegroom, that they must put one another first. He's expecting us as his bride to put him first, that in all circumstances, we make a choice to put him above any priorities in our lives. And and even though this was the plan and the purpose for Israel, they always fell short. And so Jesus could um, graft us in um, to, uh, to, to experience the help of the Holy Spirit to make us faithful to, uh, to the covenant of God. Now, God remembered these covenants with Israel because of his covenant. So the promises that he made toward them, 
um, was always brought up as a remembrance because of his covenant, his commitment. God cannot go against his um, commitment. God does not know how to fail. God does not know how to um, go against uh, promises. And therefore, he had to, to listen to their cries. And so we as, as Christians today still have the, the kind of relationship with God where he will always listen to our cries. He will always listen to, to um, our journey and even the, the shortcomings of our journeys uh, because he's committed, he's connected, his um, promises are true for us. Exodus 32, verse 11 to 14 then. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, and listen to this, he's reminding God, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember, Abram, and remember they've done a lot wrong. I just want to mention this. They've made a golden calf and uh, they started to idol worship other things than God. So they've not been committed. And still, Abram is reminding God of his promises. Um, and he says here in verse 12, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and all this land that I have promised you, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And, um, and this, you know, this is such a beautiful moment between uh, Moses and God because Moses could stand on the promise of God. You know, even though he also did not really deserve it and made a lot of mistakes, he knew that God could not go against his word. And, um, and God had to keep his uh, commitments to them. Now, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 3 to 12, um, speaks about these covenants. Um, it says, if you walk, verse 3, in my statutes and observe my commandments, and if, if this was a commitment between God and his people, between two covenant partners, this would be the... Um, Basically, the expectations that was written down to say, well, you know, I want to covenant with you. I will bring everything to the table um, and I will be committed to, to you with everything that I have. But you will have to have a counter performance as well. And that counter performance we know was uh, in the Old Testament taken very seriously and and, and Jesus came to replace that counter performance. Um, not that we are not doing the right things anymore, but our focus now is upon our relationship with Christ that transforms us, that brings us into the vine, so that when we are connected to the vine, he transforms us. Um, so Jesus himself, you know, took it one step ahead and said, you know, clearly they cannot make it. Clearly by themselves, they don't have the ability to come to the standard that God is expecting. So Jesus is for us the one that fights on our behalf, that, that, that helps us to overcome anything and everything so that we can be true to the covenant with God. And so um, the expectation was, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in their season and the land shall yield its increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest and the grape harvest shall last to the time of sowing and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. And I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. 
and I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through uh, your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and you will confirm my covenant uh, and will confirm uh, my covenant with you. You shall eat old st um, store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. Beautiful. This includes um, the blessing that comes with this covenant of rain to the land, of harvest, of income, of work. Um, but it, um, it was as long as they lived godly lives, as long as they've been commit committed to the, uh, um, the covenant with God and the commandments that he has given them. And so we know Deuteronomy to be the book of covenants, the book um, that uh, brings us back to God's promises with his people. Um, so I'm going to read a few scriptures, and I know that there's a lot of scriptures this morning, but you know we need to set a platform to understand the heartbeat of God when it comes to covenant um, uh, thinking. Deuteronomy 4, verse 26 to 31, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will left a few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. Why? Because they would, God already knew that they would be unfaithful to him um, because people are not trustworthy. Um, and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. If you search after him in all your heart and with all of your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God and he will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that swore to them. And, and so God knows that the pattern in our lives, and I want to say, you know, don't be so hard on Israel um, because we are as unfaithful. And the natural tendency in our lives is um, to fall short on covenant living. Um, in our best efforts, you know, you can tell another person that, you know, I'm trustworthy and you can trust me and I've got integrity in my life. And sometimes people are even integrity crazy. Um, because they are so um, self-indulged about um, their um, own lives and, and, and their own faithfulness and how they can, uh, you know, uh, uh, do things right. Um, and then strange that uh, sometimes that pride brings us to a fall because we realize that we, even in our best intentions, cannot be committed to, um, to somebody else. But, um, but God loves covenant understanding and so God is expecting to give the best to us but he's also expecting the best from us so um, uh, verse uh, the same chapter 6 Deuteronomy 6 verse 2 to 9 um, that you may fear the Lord your God you and your son and your your son's sons by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land of flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all of your might. And this is what covenant is about. A total commitment to the relationship with God that leads us to, to, um, to follow his commandments. Why? Because God is 
expecting us to uh, to do unreasonable things? No, because God knows best for our lives, and God knows because He's the um, the stronger partner or covenant partner, um, and He's um, all knowing. He knows what is best for us, and so He wants us not to go astray, to not. Um, experience the hardship of of um, a life of falling short of his goodness and his provision. So in verse 6 it says, And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Yo, God wants us to separate ourselves for the covenant with him as a people known, being distinguished as his people. Um, and you will even inherit those things that you've not been laboring for. Um, all of us wants to, you know, get things that we didn't labor for. Uh, God gives us these promises that he will even make things work together so much for our good that those things that we will receive from him will not even be things that we will get as a result of our work. He will bless us with things that um, that we didn't even work for. But because we are covenant partners, he wants to bless us with it. So uh, Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 to 15 says, Now therefore that the Lord... Your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandments and statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that you swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the grain and your wine and your oil and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock and the land that he swore to your fathers to give to you. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be a male or female barren among you and among the livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sicknesses and none of evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew he will inflict on you. But he will lay them on all who hate you. So we know that that thousand generations also includes us because there's not a thousand generations even if, ever since. <laughs> It includes us, the promises to, um, to us that is engrafted into um, God's promises. Deuteronomy 8 then, verse 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built your houses and live in them, and when you heard herds and flocks multiply and you, your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Now, only God can bring us wealth. Only God can bring us provision. Only God can bring us health. Only God can give us the things that is needed for us to live every day. And we must re remember this. But God knew that even even in the culture of Israel, it was necessary to say that to them. Remind yourselves of, of me being the source of life, the source of your providing. Um, because you will go astray. You will always try to, um, to take advantage of, um, of my goodness and, um, and claim it for yourself. You will think that it's because of your good doing. And so, you know, that's the biggest challenge for us is we don't put God always first because we start to rely on our own um, abilities. And God wants us to remind ourselves that 
He is good. He is faithful. He is the God that leads us in every circumstance. Uh, chapter 9 of Deuteronomy uh, four, uh, 4, verse 4, it says, Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of your righteousness, your righteousness, that the Lord has brought me into the, to possess the land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you, and that he may confirm um, the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abram and Isaac and Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. <laughs> and don't think that we are different today. Uh, we are a stubborn people that easily take credit for ourselves. And we think it's because of our doing and our skillfulness and because we've studied and we've made ourselves um, um, indispensable. And, um, and yet God is saying to us, listen, just be humble and know that I am the provider. I'm the one who, who, who orchestrate life for you. Deuteronomy um, 11 then, we're going through the Deuteronomy as you can see, because it's a book of covenants. Um, verse 22, for if you will be careful to do all the commandments that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways and holding them fast, then the Lord will drive out all the nations before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your feet treads, your territory shall be... Um, from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Ephrates to the Western Sea, no one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. These are um, amazing promises if we can stay put. Why is it so difficult for Israel then to stay put? See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey my commandments, um, which I command you today. So the, the choice is ours. The choice is the people of God's. You know, um, are they going to receive a curse or a blessing? Now, do God wants, want to curse us? No, his heart is to bless us. Um, but we need to make the decisions to, to receive his covenant, to be part of his covenant. And even though we fall short, God has made the provision for us to, um, to enter into the covenant, as you know it. Deuteronomy 26, verse 1 to 2, 2, then, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put in the basket and you shall go to the place of the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. So God wanted them to tithe because the tithe also helped them to remind themselves um, that they don't need to bless God because God is blessed <laughs> out of his socks. God don't need to, uh, uh, to be blessed. Um, he is the blessing, <laughs> uh, but he wants us to be blessed. He want, wants us to recognize that he is the provider of everything that we need. And, and sometimes God needs to circumcise our hearts in coming back to his um, promises even of, um, of giving unto him uh, just for our own circumcision of our hearts so that we can again come back to our commitments to him and, and give him the honor of what he is doing in our lives. Deuteronomy um, chapter 28 verse 1 to 14 and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all these commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I want the blessings of God to overtake me. I want it to uh, go well beyond my own um, deserving. Um, and, uh, and God is saying, this is what I will bring to you. In verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord. Blessed 
you shall be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of the ground, and the fruit of the cattle, increase of your herds and your young flock. Blessed shall be the basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you, and blessed, blessed, blessed. It's amazing. Just go and read, um, you know, chapter 28 again, um, all of it. And you will see all the blessings that is included. God is saying that I will, I will come through for you in all circumstances, even in your adversities. Blessings those who um, are to be committed to the covenant of God. And John chapter 15 verse 7, we know that God is saying, Abide in me and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The only catch in John chapter 15 is that God is saying that if you abide in me as I'm abiding in the Father, then you will be part of the branch. Now, I just want to say that that branch, um, Jesus starts chapter 15 by saying that I'm the true vine. So that means that there's a there's a not so true vine. There's one that is, um, you know, not representing um, God well. Um, and Jesus is saying that he's the true vine. So what is the not so true vine? Um, is is Israel. Because the vine was always known and the picture of the vine as God's people, as God's covenant with his people, um, his people, Israel. And um, and we see so many references in the um, in, in, in Psalm 80, for instance, uh, even Ezekiel, Isaiah, all called Israel the vine of God. Um, and so we know that they all fell short um, and Israel did not succeed in being the true vine because it was not faithful to God. But Jesus brings us into a right standing with God and he says, listen, if you are connected to me, if your heart is busy um, embracing me and understanding me uh, as, as being the source of your life, as being the one that you put first, that you stand in relationship um, with. Um, and, you know, for me, chapter 15 is such a beautiful chapter because it's just after Jesus has made to had to make um, a very hard decision in um, exposing Judas. Um, and here he's saying to them, listen, you guys have made the choice not to be the dead branches because the dead branches will be taken away. But you are those who are still alive and committed and abiding in me. You're trusting in me. You're standing till the end, until I go to the cross. And I want to say to you, Israel did not deserve for God to um, again reach out to them. And yet God always did. But we as the people of God have the opportunity to always stay put in our covenant with him if we stay in relationship. If anything in our lives, we should not focus on material things or the provision or even the, the benefits of the covenant, but the fact that we have a true relationship with Christ. And, and that place of security brings us to a place of safety because we know that whatever happens to our lives, God loves us so much that he will work it together for our good. Deuteronomy 28 verse 8 says, The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Um, but you will have to make the decision where you position yourself. And it's not um, this hard, oppressing you know, relationship that um, needs to uh, be fulfilled in works. We know that uh, chapter 15 of John is even saying that you will be known as being my disciples because you are doing my commandments. Why? Is it a burden again? Is it something that God is expecting of you to always do? Or is it because... You love him and you are connected to him and you are committed to him that he transforms you and makes you to live. I love, you know, John 15 because it says that if you're connected to the vine, it means that you will bear fruit. And that fruit that you will be bearing, you know, for a, for a fruit on a tree, you're an apple or a pear or whatever, you know, you there's not a lot of work involved. Um 
you are just an apple <laughs> uh, on a tree and you must just be because the tree will give the source and even the DNA for those fruits to be formed and shaped. And so we are so concerned about what we are getting right and wrong in our walking Christianity that we forget that it's in being that we start to flourish. It's in being in this covenant. It's in being in relationship with God, but it's something that we must treasure and that we must fight for. Um, because if you're close to him, he will transform you. He will make you to be that perfect fruit. Because God says that you cannot be his disciple and not show fruit. Um, but because you are spending time with him. And so I want to encourage you this morning. When it gets to a relationship with him, it means that you and I will have to readjust our thinking. That, um, that he's the greater partner. He's the perfect one. He's the one that um, brings everything to the table. And even though we fall short, we must remember that our covenant with him is precious because of our dependency on him. Because we cannot make it. And because God knew in even making Abram to sleep, um, he, 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 he knew that Abram would not make it. We would not make it. But because we abide in him, because we love him, because we treasure our relationship with him, good works spring forth from our lives and we do the commandments of God lovingly and, and extravagantly uh, because he is the focus in our lives. And so, you know, God sticks to his covenant. He's not going to go anywhere. He's not going to walk away from you. He is committed. Psalm 89 uh, verse 35 says, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I've sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Psalm 105 verse 8, he remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Yo, um, this is amazing. Isaiah Chapter 55, verse 10 to 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which is purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I've sent it. God is committed to you. God is... Um, He's not going to walk away from the words that he has spoken over your life. And he's not going to walk away from the promises that he has given you. He is committed. And so he, he speaks into our lives and he says, arise, shine. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 to 5. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. That nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Light, uh, oh, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. And so I want to say to you, Abram then, you know, went into this covenant with God, knowing that he is falling so short. There's no ways that he could, um, could fulfill anything toward a God that is perfect. God allowed him to take the animal and part it in two and uh, walk in an eight um, format, which also resembles... Um, eternity because of the eternal covenant that he's making toward us um, as his people. And um, he walked through that or used a torch um, and he went through these uh, two uh, pieces of, of meat. <laughs> and um, while Abram was sleeping, God was making this covenant and saying, as in uh, biblical times with covenant, that uh, you know, I'm committed, and um, and blood 
is the sign of our commitment toward one another. But you know what Abram had to do? He had to keep the vultures away because the vultures wanted to take hold of the carcass all the time. The only job that Abram had to do was to keep all the vultures away from the holiness, the, the precious moment of commitment between God and his people. And in our lives, I can tell you, there's vultures all the time that wants to come and sit on our um, sacred moments with God, our sacred relationship with God, our sacred moments where God makes promises to us and the enemy always come to say to us, did God really say? Did God really promise? Is God really committed to you? Are you um, even able to fulfill the promises that God has set for you? Are you able to be so committed to God? No, you aren't. <laughs> and that's the good news today is God knows that. God has made you and he knows that you will always fall short, but he's so satisfied over you. He loves you and he wants his promises to be fulfilled over your life. God is committed. And this morning I want to say to you, um, stop using excuses for falling short of a a covenant relationship with God um, that will bring you to um, a life of commitment to the Almighty God, you know, by uh, making a decision to follow Him and to give your heart to Him, brings you into an eternal relationship with the Almighty. And I want to say to you that's something sacred. Don't think that committing your life to Christ is just... Um, something superfluous or something you know uh, that is um, easy to do it is a great commitment but it's the best commitment that you will ever make because it commits you to eternity but it also gives you a life of fulfillment and promise in God so if you are here this morning and you don't know a covenant relationship with Christ you've not given your heart wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior and also in control of your life and I want to encourage you this morning, make such a decision, walk into a covenant with God so that you can also receive the blessings of it, but so that you will um, come into the, the, the reason why you've been created, you know, to, um, to fellowship with God. And if you are this morning walking astray and, you know, you are missing the the mark with God, um, you know, don't, don't be cut off. Because the sign always of, you know, our um, commitment to God is, you know, just our lukewarmness. The fact that we are, you know, not as committed as we should be. And that is such a, um, a portraying of our hearts. Because within our hearts, if we are committed to God and we have a relationship with Him, we will do anything that He expects us. But we also we always want to change our lives first and trust that we will be able to change our lives and then come to Christ. There's no ways that you can live a life of fullness if Christ doesn't transform you. And this morning, it's it's time to surrender. It's time to to acknowledge that you are not able to fulfill this covenant. You are not able to fulfill the promises that God has for you. It's time to surrender and to be grafted in the relationship with God. And my wish this morning, my desire is um, to pray with you and trust God, that God would really, um, you know, have such a relationship with you. He's standing with open arms and he's waiting. He's saying, my child, I've made you. And I stand with the promises that I've made toward Abram and uh, Israel. And I'm standing today before you and I can say that you are included in these promises. Um, if you don't have a relationship or you're walking astray, please make sure to, to get involved and, and contact us. You know, there's a, a few um, ways in which you can connect with us and we would gladly um, call you back or you know, even chat online with you 
um, so that you can make those commitments. But know that a life without God is, um, is a life without, you know, the fullness of what God wants us to experience. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a faithful God. Your promises is true to us. We can uh, testify of this. We can testify of your goodness in all spheres of life. And Father, this morning we pray that you will raise people, Father God, that can um, represent you well. People that can, Father, change lives around them and touch people's lives and touch the world and and, and do great exploits for you, not because of their own strength and their own abilities, but because you that are ruling within them. And we pray this morning, Father God, that those who don't have a relationship with you will now have the opportunity, Father, to, uh, to embrace you, to make you part of their lives and to recognize that they can't live without you anymore. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. <music>